वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु In the Bhagavad Gita, we are studying the second chapter. Broadly, in the second chapter, you have um, three three topics. The first topic is about enlightenment. Who am I? Knowing that I am the Atman. So that's the first teaching. In fact, if there's one thing you want to take away from the Bhagavad Gita, from Vedanta, it would be that: What is my real nature? The second teaching is what we are doing now about Karma Yoga. how do i transform my day to day life into spiritual practice and the last one which we are approaching not today later on and the last part of the second chapter is the result of all of this arjuna will ask krishna so suppose i attain enlightenment what will it be like how is this enlightened person different from uh, the rest of us so that will be the question but right now we are in the second topic how do i spiritualize my life karma yoga and the central teaching of the karma yoga we have seen last time that do the work which we were earlier doing the same work what we were earlier doing to satisfy our desires uh, for selfish purposes do it as a service as a worship of god without expectation of results what some results will come but that need not be the motivation for the work do not work for the results but work without detachment with with detachment as worship of god and do not give in to inaction as well do not give in give in to laziness so we had a detailed discussion last time one point i'll just an up quick observation some of you may have noted i keep saying that karma yoga is doing work whatever work we do as worship of god without attachment to results two things i am not doing it for selfish ends and i'm doing it as worship of god the discerning among you might have noticed where is this worship of god angle coming in because krishna never mentioned it so far it will come later on in other chapters but right now notice that he just says karmanya vadikaraste you have the right to the work not to the results do not work for the results do not give in to inaction either finished the word god has not come in so far anywhere in this chapter it will later on that's the finished doctrine of karma yoga that's why i keep saying it and in the sanskrit commentaries which i'm using for all of this it keeps saying that it's parameshwara aradhanartham for the worship of the lord uh, do this work so but it is true that worship of uh, the doing the work as worship of god is not mentioned so far in in the gita and it's important to note that suppose and there are many these days who are um if not atheistic not particularly interested in the whole god business as they call it fine so can i do karma yoga certainly you can this work has to be done why it's my duty to do it why because it is good why it will do good to a lot of people therefore it is to be done not for my personal selfish ends if i do it just with this attitude is it karma yoga without bringing god into the equation yes in fact that's literally what krishna said to arjuna he didn't bring god in here uh, that's why swami vivekananda in his karma yoga um he of course talks about doing worship as uh, doing work as worship of god but he also mentions duty for duty's sake do the work because it is to be done i have no other uh, you know angle to this so one can do karma yoga like that also but it's actually much easier if you if you have a little bit of faith if we have a little bit of faith in god and most of us we do many people declare themselves proudly i don't like all that god i'm an atheist is easy to talk <laughs> and not so easy so but if we have a little bit of faith in god the idea that i'm doing it for my beloved lord it makes that duty that much sweeter that work which is dry harsh duty it becomes much sweeter if i'm doing it as worship of my beloved now i have made up my mind i'm going to make rapid progress today 
I remember we had a teacher, a Swami, um, who used to teach us when we were novices, and he would say that. He, he would easily get sidetracked. So he would come with a very firm and stern expression on his face, and he would say, today I'm not going to get sidetracked. I'm going to finish this portion. And we, as mischievous brahmacharis, novices, we knew how to, um, yes, we would ask, uh, or we would say something that was totally wrong, you know, it was, it's not correct, and he would get furious and start correcting us. Or we would ask for a story, what was the story about such and such thing, about Vivekananda or Thakur? And he would go off on this with nice story, he loved telling stories. And at the end, when the bell would ring, and he would lo look shocked, I didn't do anything today. <laughs> so, but no, I'm going to make progress today. So the topic of Karma Yoga continues. Verse number 48. 47 is the central verse, which we have done. 48. Yogastha Kuru Karmani Yogastha Kuru Karmani Sangam Tyaktva Dhananjaya Sangam Tyaktva Dhananjaya Siddhya Siddhya Yo Samo Bhutva Siddhya Siddhya Yo Samo Bhutva Samatvam Yoga Uchyate Samatvam Yoga Uchyate Do thy work, o, o Arjuna, established in Yoga. Do perform your actions, giving up attachment. And unconcerned about the success or failure. This evenness of mind is called Yoga. This is the verse. Now he says, how should you do your work? Which work? Here he does not mean uh, your Vedanta. He means your day-to-day -day work. The, the work of being a warrior, of a householder. All the work that you do at home and at, in the community and in your profession. Yoga stha kuru karmani. Do work established in yoga. What yoga is meant here? Karma yoga. What is karma yoga? The commentator says, Parameshwara eka parata tatrastitaha. Being one-pointed devotion to God, established in that. See, nowhere in the picture God is there, but the God is introduced by the commentator. And they're not wrong. It will be introduced in other chapters later on. My devotion to my Lord, my Krishna or Ramakrishna or Christ in whatever form, my devotion to my God, this is God's work now. The work in the temple and church obviously is God's work, but the work in the office is God's work. Work in the house is God's work, internally. And being established in that one-pointedness. Sangam Tyaktva, giving up attachments. Uh, this particular commentator, Sridhar Swami says, here it means giving up all other support. I am doing work not with the help of other people or money or health or my, my education. All of those are there, but my real support is God. I am doing work for God and with God's help. I remember a beautiful story about a senior Swami who, was, who worked very hard all his life and he was ill towards the end of his life, very ill and he was um, staying, we have a place where old monks stay in our main monastery and he would say, I never met him, I heard from others, he would say with such great peace in his face, you know, he would say there is a joy in being taken up and used and broken and set aside. The, but God has taken me up and used me as an instrument. Through me he has worked for the welfare of God, for the welfare of all. And now the instrument is broken and has been set aside. There is great peace in that also. I was reading Swami Turiyanandaji, he is saying to a monk, no, to a young devotee, work hard. Whatever task the Lord sets before you, do it with all your heart. He says, prandi, with all your heart. When you finish one work, you will see the Lord will give you another. And when you finish that, the Lord will give you another. And he will give you a few such works, after which he will, you, you are retired permanently. <laughs> he said, For, forever, in an eternal vacation. In the Bible, Jesus Christ says very beautifully, For my yoke is light. Come unto me, ye that are heavy laden. You are suffering in the world, unhappy, burdened. Give all that up 
at the feet of the Lord. I will also make you work. God also makes you work. But he says, my yoke is light. It is a joy to work for God. You will not suffer. You will not get caught in this. But the Lord will make you work for some time. Why? For our own spiritual progress. Karma yoga, he will make us do. I remember in, in California and in Hollywood, you have to remember, the context is important. It's Hollywood. So in our Vedanta society, Saturday, um, once in a fortnight or so, it's set, set aside for karma yoga. So there's an announcement in the website. And this lady comes along in her yoga pants and yoga mat. That, <laughs> what's, what's this new karma yoga? Uh, that's, it's the latest brand of uh, variety of yoga. And then she was told, no, here, just, the Swami just makes you work hard. That's all. <laughs> You're going to be cleaning, pruning, working in the garden, things like that. But um, bless her heart, she worked very hard and she did that kind of karma yoga. <laughs> so the Lord makes you do this. And he says, Siddhya Siddhayor, success or failure. Not only worldly success or failure, the commentators point out the ultimate success or failure, that whether I become enlightened or not. He says, Tatphalasya Jnanasya Api. The result of all these spiritual practices is enlightenment. Don't even keep your mind on that. I do this out of love for my Lord. Not because, when are you giving me enlightenment again? <laughs> I've been at it for 20 years, 30 years. I didn't sign up for this. No, even let that go also. Swami Vivekananda says, fix your end, the, the goal in mind, then take up the means and give all your heart to the means. When the means are perfected, the end will come of itself. So when you are not so much concerned with the success and failure, what will happen is, Harsha Vishadaya Samabhutva. Harsha means elation. Enthusiastic, elation, um, delight. Oh, this worked out so well. Um, in America we'll say, wow, great. And the opposite, the more wow you do, the other, other thing is also there. The moment it fails, there's a slight problem, depressed. <laughs> depression. Free of elation and depression. Whether it's successful or it's a failure in worldly terms, it's always a success because you're worshipping God. It's internal motivation. You're always successful. Externally, there might be success sometimes and there might, not might, will be success sometimes and will be failure sometimes. Worldly people are caught in that and they go through these waves of ups and downs. Don't be caught in that. Don't, be, don't go through these waves of ups and downs, elation and depression, even-mindedness. Be even-minded. Even-minded only when you take your eyes off the results. I mentioned this earlier, this person who did wonderful, who is doing wonderful work for orphan children in India. Uh, more than a thousand kids he's taking care of, all free. Um, so somebody asked him, I was there, somebody asked him, uh, you are so successful, so what motivates you? And he, he said something wonderful. He's an original thinker too. And people are amazed by the work he does, but I noticed uh, that what he says, it's all original thinking. He has read all philosophy, Vivekananda, everything. But when he speaks, it's just coming from within. For example, his answer to the question about motivation. How do you keep your motivation up? He said, I have an external motivation and an internal, intrinsic motivation. The external motivation is, I was taking care of three kids first, and then it was 50, then it was 500, now it's a thousand. Good. It's progressing. And it's motivating. So I have milestones and these are being covered. But I also know it could have failed. There are so many non-profits no, I'm not doing too well either. It could have failed. There's no guarantee that it, it would have succeeded the way it did. But my internal motivation is, this is the right thing to do. My heart tells me it's the right thing to do. I'll keep on doing it even if I don't succeed. If externally success, that's one thing. Intern which is good, very good. God's blessing is there. But internally, it's the right thing to do. Therefore, I'm doing it External success and failure does not make such a difference. There's peace of mind because I know I'm doing the right thing to do. That is, you are covered against the ups and downs. You're proof against elation and uh, depression. In contrast to this is the work that we generally do. 
verse number 49. Our daily activities, uh, how do they go and what are they like? 49. Durena yavaram karma Durena yavaram karma Buddhi yoga dhananjaya Buddhi yoga dhananjaya Buddha sharanaman vichcha Buddha sharanaman vichcha Kripana phala hetava Kripana phala hetava Far inferior is the work prompted by desire compared to the karma yoga. O oh, oh Arjuna, so take refuge in wisdom, buddha sharanam uh, anvicha. Those who work for satisfaction of their worldly desires, they are, kripana word is interesting. The word kripana is used, literally it means the misers or the petty or the small or inferior, or miserable. This is a word used in the Upanishads to talk about those who do not attain enlightenment. Come to the human birth and depart without attaining God, without attaining Brahma Jnana, attaining enlightenment, moksha. This is what human life is for. Not having done that, I go away from this world. Kripanaha, the, the petty, the small, the miserable, the unfortunate. Um, num number of times. In the Brihadaranek Upanishad, for example, it is said, Yo va ita daksharam gargya viditva aviditva smad lokat praiti sakripanaha. Yagya Valkya, the great Rishi in the Brihadaranyak says to Gargi, by the way, woman, she was a great uh, philosopher. Uh, in fact, in the Brihadaranyak Upanishad, you find these debates between Yagya Valkya, who is kind of the hero of the Brihadaranyak Upanishad. And his main opponent, there are a series of other philosophers who come and challenge him and the, the discourses form most of the, um, or a big part of the Upanishad. And his main opponent is Gargi, who is the most prominent among in the whole um, uh, range of philosophers there. So he says to Gargi, O Gargi, those who depart from this world without having realized the imperishable, aksharam aviditva, Without realizing the imperishable, those who depart from this world, Kripanaha, ah, Sakripana, that one is an unfortunate one, uh, the petty one, the, the miserable one. The Keno Upanishad uh, says, um, that Mahati Vinashti, it says, that great is the destruction, great is the loss of the one who departs from this world without enlightenment. I forget the exact one um, line. Bhuteshu viteshu chitya dhira pretya smad lokad amrita bhavanti. We'll come back. Anyway, so Kripanaha, in the Mandukya, those who attend the Mandukya class, you will realize, you will remember in the first verse of the third chapter, it says, Upasana Shrito Dharma, Jate Brahmani Vartate, Pragutpatte Rajam Sarvam, Tena So Kripana Svritaha. So, those who remain in dualism throughout their lives, and they think that, yes, we were all one reality before creation. But now I am a miserable little human being. And God is something separate from me. Uh, this separation. So that one is called a kripana, a miserable one. A petty one. Because the one has fractured oneself, separated oneself from the, from the infinite. So the idea is we must not be like this. Now in this verse... The one who acts for fulfilling worldly desires is called Kripanaha. You might say, uh oh, that's not good news. <laughs> True, but all of us, we have to transcend this. The very fact that we are here, we are looking for spiritual wisdom, we are trying to work in spiritual life, get uh, to, to evolve spiritually, that means we are trying to overcome what is called Karpanyam, the, the state of being a Kripana. 
So I am now trying to become spiritual. So overcome my Kripana status, change it to uh, the enlightened one. What is a Kripana? The, the one who works for the fulfillment of petty personal desires. Durena Hyavaram Karma. Far inferior is the lower work. Lower work means work done for fulfillment of desires. Compared to Buddhi Yoga Dhananjaya. Compared to Karma Yoga. The thing is the word used here is Buddhi Yoga. A peculiar term which comes in the Gita. If you literally trans translate it, it becomes Wisdom Yoga. Now the commentator gives two meanings for this. What is this Wisdom Yoga? This Wisdom Yoga is Karma Yoga. What we are discussing now. One meaning. Or he says, this karma yoga is a means to wisdom, to enlightenment. Therefore it's called wisdom yoga. What are the two interpretations? One is, buddhi yoga means karma yoga. Buddhi yoga is equal to karma yoga. To do the work as worship of God selflessly. Or it might mean, I'm practicing this with another aim in view. That is enlightenment. Do you remember the structure of spiritual practice? It's good to keep it in mind. Problem Solution, method, three columns. Problem, um, the problems are ignorant mind, scattered mind, impure mind. Solution for ignorant mind, knowledge, knowledge enlightenment. Solution for impure mind, purity. Or the solution for scattered mind, concentration. Solution for impure mind, purity. What are the methods? For gaining enlightenment, Jnana Yoga is the method. Shravana, Manana, Niridhyasana, to hear this constantly, to, to meditate upon this, to reason this out. What is the method to concentration? Meditation. Devotion and meditation. And what is the method of attaining purity of mind? Karma, karma Yoga. So now you see, he says Karma Yoga is a means to enlightenment. What is the process there? By purifying my mind through Karma Yoga, with that pure mind, when I meditate, I get a concentrated mind. With that pure and concentrated mind, this Vedanta gives me enlightenment directly. Yeah. Keep that structure in mind, but hold it loosely. It's only a structure. It's a paradigm. Is it the only possible paradigm? As I said, no. There are, other, there are many ways. Infinite are the paths to God. This is matrix created by you? Um, no, this is the structure in uh, Advaita Vedanta. But... I guess they didn't talk about it as a matrix. I just sort of put it this way. Yeah. Um, you have a question? Yes. So, you mentioned in Anitra Mandakya Upanishad, which says that people who are still lost in the dualism are petty or something along those lines. So, I was wondering that other interpretations of Vedanta, like that of Sangha Nidra and Mahamadraya, yeah. they also you know, consider the same books, the Upanishads they're carrying. But there doesn't seem like there are two ways to interpret what was said in the Mandakya. Right. Is it, is it not part of the canon or do they just disagree? It's a good question. The question is, I'm repeating the question. I've been told infinite number of times to repeat the question. There are, there's an audience around the world who can't hear the question, so they get very irritated. Uh, the question is, you just mentioned the Mandakya and said that uh, those who are in duality are Kripana. Uh, the verse in Mandakya says that. But there are other interpretations of Vedanta, Ramanuja's interpretation, Madhva's interpretation. They are all dualistic interpretations. So they are also based on the Upanishads. There doesn't seem to be two ways of saying this, what I just said. So isn't it part of their canon? Isn't it part of their texts? Notice, what I quoted was from the Mandukya Karika, not from the Mandukya Upanishad. The Mandukya Karika is composed by Gaudapada. Um, the, that uh, Gaurapada is a strict non-dualist. Gaurapada is Shankaracharya's guru's guru. So he's a strict non-dualist. Um, his interpretation of Mandukya is strictly non-dual. Therefore he says something like this. This verse will not be quoted by Ramanuja or Madhva. <laughs> it will create a lot of confusion. If they, but they definitely accept the Mandukya Upanishad, but they give a dualistic meaning to it. Here also, this, all this karma yoga, it sounds dualistic, and it is. But the ultimate goal is self-knowledge, which is non-dualistic. So, Gaudapada will not have any objection to this. He will say it's a good preparation. So, from a non-dual perspective, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, they're all good preparations. 
And Jnana Yoga is privileged above everything else. Does, does that answer your query? Yeah. To answer it directly, no. They would not take this this particular verse composed by Gaudapada as an authoritative one. But they will definitely take the Mandukya Upanishad, not the Karika, as uh, part of their canon. They have to, because it's based on the Upanishad. And then, Buddha Sharanam Anvicha, take refuge in Buddhi. Now, Uh, this also is given two interpretations. Literally, if you translate it, take refuge in wisdom. But if the two interpretations are that yasma evam tasmad buddho papa nivritti dwara jnane sharanam ashrayam karma yogam anvicha anutishta. Uh, what does it mean? That in order to overcome the impurities of mind, Take refuge in karma yoga so that you will attain to enlightenment. You see the, why the structure is useful? Where did impurity of mind come and where does the whole structure will immediately understand what he wants to say here. He says take, ref take refuge in wisdom means take up karma yoga, spiritualize your day to day work. So that you will purify the mind of its impurities resulting ultimately in wisdom or enlightenment. All that he gets from this word take refuge in wisdom. Um, that's one interpretation. Another interpretation also interesting. Take refuge in wisdom. You see, here is where Sanskrit grammar comes in useful. The seventh case means in, means literally in that locus. In the one who stays in your buddhi or intellect or in your wisdom. Who stays inside us? God. So take refuge in God who shines within your mind or your heart or your intellect. Take refuge in that God. And do your work. That also can be the meaning. And he says, Yadva, or else you can take another interpretation. Buddha Sharanam, refuge in Buddhi means, Trataram Ishwaram Ashraya, take refuge in Ishwara, the God who is the Savior, Trataram, who saves you from samsara. Then, number 50. Buddhi yukto jahati ha, buddhi yukto jahati ha, ubhe sukrita dushkrite, ubhe sukrita dushkrite, tasmad yoga yayujjasva, tasmad yoga yayujjasva, yoga karma sukaushalam, yoga karma sukaushalam. Endowed with this wisdom. Which wisdom? Karma Yoga. How to spiritualize my daily action. Endowed with this wisdom, one gets rid of both good and evil. Both good and evil, I'll explain that. Even here. Therefore, take to yoga. Yoga is skill in work. This requires explanation and some unpacking. How do you, what, what do you mean overcoming good and evil? We are supposed to become good. No, not um, uh, overcoming evil is understood, but you're supposed to become good. Here there's a technical meaning. The words used are sukrita dushkrita. Good actions means dharmic actions, religious actions, pious actions. Dushkrita means sinful actions. Now usually the lower religion, the mass religion sh says, give up sinful actions, give up papa karma. Adharma, not dharma. And do that which is religious, good, uh, which is meritorious. Why? The why is important. If you do that which is bad and clearly your conscience tells you this is wrong, then the result is suffering. In this world and after death, the other place is there. Some people say, oh, the, that's a Christian thing. It's not in Hinduism. Oh, no, Hinduism has not one, but many hells. <laughs> Only difference is they are not permanent. They're all caused by my, by my action. So I get the results of my bad action. There are special uh, places for me uh, where my bad action is burnt off. And the good action, the dharma, the pious action, after death, you go to these much better places, which are, again, a whole range of heavens. 
So the traditional ritualistic Vedic Hindu, the paradigm he thought in was, he or she thought in was, after death, let me be good in this life, let me do all the rituals prescribed by the religion and be good and moral in my day-to-day -day life, so that, so that, after death I do not have to go to the bad place, after death I go to heaven, good place. I heard there is a TV serial about going to heaven called the good place TV serial, where everybody goes to heaven and what happens there and so on. But that's a result of dharma of doing good work with a motive in mind. That's also motivated. I had said at the beginning, there's a difference between mass religion and spirituality. Spirituality, Vedanta, is not meant for going from this place to that place or changing this for that. Vedanta is meant for realizing the truth and freedom. I want freedom from this entire business of going here and going and coming <laughs> and attaining this and losing that. So enlightenment is God-realization, salvation, whatever you call it. That is different. There you should not have this motive. Even, of course, I will not do anything sinful or bad or uh, evil. But I will also not tr try to do good things so that I can go to heaven. Why will I do good things? Then what will I do in life? I will do good. Here is the important thing. I will do good continuously, without break. But I will do that for my own purification, for the welfare of the world. I am doing that for God-realization, not for going to heaven afterwards. Yeah. So that's what he means. You will overcome both good and evil means. Not that you will become some kind of amoral creature. You will be very moral, very ethical. But it's not for an ulterior purpose. People will give me awards in this life and next life I will go to heaven. Uh, not for that purpose. I, uh, I remember there was a game, it's like a board game. Um, we find it in the gospel also, they uh, played, it was called Golok Dhana, I think. So you play like with, with dice and you have a counter which moves, it's like snakes and ladders and I don't know if kids play that anymore, maybe they do on computers. Um, now in this game is you have to go to the highest heaven of Vishnu. Uh, you have to be in the abode of Vishnu, that's the goal. But in, in, on the way, there are good and bad places, including a number of hells. And those hells are very nicely depicted. In one, there's a big cauldron, and the poor fellow who falls into that is being roasted and boiled. Um, and you can't die because you're already dead. And so, <laughs> and, there's, there's, and there's this other place, it's very nice little cartoons and and, and those, those uh, the, the little imps and devils, they look like really cool creatures, you know, like they're really having the time of their lives. <laughs> then there are, the, another he uh, hell was full of thorns and uh, wild animals and, uh, uh, you know, it's like that. Um, I, I actually saw that and I think, did we play or not? But I had one of those, you know, they are all obsolete now, but we, in our monastery we had one of those uh, boards. <laughs> You two questions, just a minute. Here I had a question, I'll come back to you. So, uh, Maharaj, uh, if we work for the purification of my mind, yes. how do you say that that's not selfish? Like, like what's the if I work for purification of my mind, how do I say it's not selfish? It's a question which keeps coming back again and again. Is the desire for God realization selfish or not? The answer is no. Why not? Because we must first understand what is meant by selfish. What is meant by selfish is, when I am completely attached to this little body and mind, and all my actions are for this body and mind, everything is for me and mine, I and my family, and that's it. I don't care what happens to others. So, my family also, notice that it's connected to mine, it's connected to this body. So, identification with the body, actions done for that, for keeping this body happy, this particular person happy, that's selfish. Whereas enlightenment, God realization, whatever you call it, salvation, that actually cuts at the root of this selfishness. So you are no longer doing it for your particular, this body and mind. When I say I'm doing it for enlightenment, I'm doing it for karma yoga, I'm doing it to purify my mind, but what am I doing? 
I am doing it all without regard to the particular petty results which come to me. It will come. If you do work, it will come. But I don't, I'm not doing it for that anymore. I'm not doing it because it's my duty. I'm not doing it because it's for the welfare of others. I'm not doing it because it's worship of God. Nothing for me particularly. And all that I want for myself is God. But it literally is a shorthand or it's a placeholder for saying I'm overcoming this pettiness, this smallness, this kripana. Kripana is smallness. God realization leads to the vast. That is unselfish. That's a wonderful goal to have. Sri Ramakrishna put all this in a very simple way. He would say in his colloquial Bengali that uh, uh, sweets cause acidity, uh, acid reflux. But sugar candy is not to be counted among sweets. Michri. Uh, because it, it uh, it's acts as an antacid. Similarly, desire for the world, it causes suffering. But desire for God is not to be counted as a desire because it destroys all suffering and destroys all worldly desire also. Right. So we, the, the interpretation of the, the fact that evenness of mind, uh, you said, gets us beyond the effect of good and bad actions. Hmm. Could it also mean that um, just by performing karma yoga that you get beyond good and evil? Like the Atman is pure and gets beyond good and evil. So are you asking, the question is, just by performing karma yoga, can you go beyond good and evil? Can you, in the sense that, can you go beyond good and evil? Can you attain the Atman? Can you become enlightened? Uh, actually, Swami Vivekananda would say yes. But the structure that we have set up here, uh, because of the traditional Vedanta, would say, no, no, no. From karma yoga, you have to come to meditation. From meditation, you have to come to knowledge. Yes. But we are doing all of that at the same time anyway. Yes. See, this is the question again. Does, the question is, does bhakti yoga not purify the mind? The answer is yes, yes it does. Do you notice what I said? That uh, this paradigm which I gave is one paradigm. It's the paradigm of classical Advaita Vedanta. To understand Shankaracharya and the followers of Shankara like Sridhar and others, you have to keep it in mind. What's the role of karma yoga? What's the role of dhyana? What's the role of bhakti? And what's the role of jnana, knowledge? Knowledge, devotion, love... And knowledge, love, meditation and work. They all have the particular, it's like a structure. But if you say, suppose just by love of God, can my mind be purified? Yes. Yes. Can my mind be concentrated? Yes. Do I have to do all the yogic meditations? No, no. It can be concentrated. Can knowledge, enlightenment come? Yes. Because, how will enlightenment come? Because God will give you that enlightenment. That Gita himself uh, in Sri Krishna will say to my uh, to my devotees I give buddhi that means wisdom I, I will give Sri Ramakrishna used to say my mother has shown me everything so if you take up just one pointed love it will work at all levels but I would say so what is the conclusion then <laughs> it's up to you Hinduism always presents a wide menu of choices. And I always say it's safer and better to use all our powers. You have the power to love, you have the power to do, you have the power to know and understand, to concentrate. All the four yogas in harmony, in tandem, are very good. Just each of the yogas, Swami Premeshananda has an essay on this. Each yoga by itself has attendant dangers. Swami Vivekananda said, by practicing all of these yogas together, they balance each other. Equipoising, balancing and evening out the disadvantages of each. Very quickly, what are the disadvantages? Bhakti yoga can lead to sentimentalism. Uh, um, uh, the, the weepy kind of devo <laughs> devotee. And uh, um, interested in festivals and pujas and um, the food and the, and the, the ritual. That, it's very natural. And there are such people. So they become... Whereas, karma yoga, the other yogas balance it out. What is the problem with karma yoga? Doing good to others. It makes your mind extroverted. It leads to uh, immediate success and, and, and popularity in the world. See, all the other yogas are private, but karma yoga is not private. You're engaged with the world. And when you do your work with evenness of mind, with calmness and serenity and with the welfare of others in mind, you'll become popular immediately. 
Who doesn't like a person who is, who is sacrificing, doing things for you? The, the, you? People will like you. And so you have schools and colleges and hospitals. Monks, we, we do that kind of work in, in India. And society, I mean, I've, I've been told that really all these people who come to you, they are not coming to you for your Vedanta and Advaita and all that in India. They're coming because they have a child to put in the school or a patient to be admitted in your hospital or something like that. And society appreciates the good work that you do. The government appreciates the good work that you do. So immediate success and popularity, that's one result of Karma Yoga, immediate. All the other yogas, their success is, takes time and it's all internal. Who knows? Oh, I had deep meditation today. Yeah. But what's it to, what's it to me? What's it to me? Didn't do me any good. Uh, and what's it, what's it to me anyway? You got some peace of mind. So. so that's the problem with karma yoga. It was not meant to make you extroverted and one gets swept away. After all, it's good work. Balance comes. I remember a monks in our, uh, our, our senior monks, they would say, if they saw the young novices getting too involved in the work apps aspect, go back to your room, sit and meditate. If you cannot meditate, you sleep in your room. Don't come out, study or sleep also. Don't come out until the dinner bell is rung. You stay in, like you're staying in a cell. The mind is restless. So the mind wants an excuse to go out and do things. So a certain level, because it's a monastery, a certain level is set. You can't go out and party or do anything like that. You're stuck there. What's there? Only some good work is there. So the mind finds a very good excuse. Even in the evening when you're supposed to meditate. Um, here uh, I am working in the office or studying in the library. No. Senior monks would keep a watch over the novices. Go back, meditate, go to the temple and meditate, or go back to your room. Balance. What's the problem with meditation? Dhyana Yoga, Raja Yoga? Makes you selfish. My meditation, my peace of mind, I've seen. Good yogis, really good, sincere yogis. They become a kind of perfectionist, and also my peace of mind, my routine. Uh, leave me alone. And when things don't go my way, how upset I get so quickly. I have seen yogis in the Himalayas. Really peaceful, wonderful. But there is a weakness there. Bring them here. It will be like a fish out of water. <laughs> they will get rattled very easily. Swami Vivekananda said, the ideal of Karma Yoga is... When you are standing, he used the, uh, uh, the example of New York. He said some street, he said in New York, you're standing there, today it would be Times Square. Your mind will be as calm as if you are in a mountain cave. And he says, when you are meditating in the mountain cave, your mind should be so alert and active. It, says it can work like a blast furnace that you can meditate, pray, whatever you're doing, it can do that. That kind of evenness. What is the problem with Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge? Intellectualization. It becomes, oh, I've read that book. I know that argument. And I can beat you in all arguments. But that doesn't help you to <laughs> yeah, become enlightened. So these are the problems of the individual yogas. Bhakti Yoga can do all of the work. Can meditation purify my mind? There are accounts of yogis in meditation when the desires come up. If we read these accounts who at, at the very subtle level, they uproot the desires in the mind itself. But it's very difficult. It's much easier to do that. As Swami told me, he says it's only advanced yogis who can do that. Ordinary people like us, we need external struggle. Very valuable advice. Ordinary people like us to progress in spiritual life, we need external struggle. Difficult people, poor health, financial worries, work. <laughs> Um, uh, bad weather, parking worries, <laughs> all of that is a good training ground. Can I keep my mind calm and peaceful while doing what is, n what is needed? Yes, a sp spiritual gymnasium, right? Swami Vivekananda uses this, uh, this metaphor. He says it's like a gymnasium where we come to work. And this purifies the mind. You can do the same thing sitting in meditation, but that you'll have to be a very accomplished meditator. Somebody used a very beautiful example. There are surgical instruments. 
and there are doctors here, you know, surgical, they are very fine and well balanced, sterilized. And there's a spade by which you can remove mud. Now you can remove mud with the surgical instrument also. But it's a very difficult process and you'll damage the instrument in that, in that process. You can remove the mud in the mind with the help of meditation also. But it's a long, convoluted and, and unnecessarily uh, difficult process. It may sound easier, oh, if I sit quietly and I can remove all, purify my mind, it won't work. <laughs> Just fall asleep. <laughs> so, the harmony of four yogas is very good. And with a few exceptions, with a few exceptions, most teachers in Hinduism, the different schools of Vedanta, they will recommend all the four yogas in different combinations. If somebody mentioned Ramanuja. He also recommends Karma Yoga. His ladder is Karma Yoga, um, Jnana, Jnana and Dhyana. Dhyana is not emphasized. Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. By Karma Yoga, purify the mind. By Jnana Yoga, realize that you are a spark of consciousness, that you are not the body-mind, you are a witness consciousness. And then have Bhakti to the total consciousness, because Vishishtadvaita is total and part. So your relation to Parameshwara is, the, the Supreme Lord is devotion, love. That's the final thing. And then he takes off from there, everything is about bhakti. That is Ramanuja's point of view. But notice that he gives importance to all the yogas. There are teachers, I know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who says love itself is enough. A to Z, everything is done by love. Yes. All right. So, Ubhesh Sukrita Dushkrite, go beyond this mass religion of being trying to be meritorious and trying to avoid sinful action. I'll do good work so I'll go to heaven afterwards and have a good time and I will avoid sinful work so that I don't be, I'm not punished by it. This religion of reward and punishment, fear, that's a kind of religion but that's a very lower form of religion. One must transcend that very soon. One must, uh, one must go beyond that. I am good because I like being good. I am good because it's my nature, it fits my nature. My real nature is the Atman, it's pure consciousness. It's, it's, it's complete, it is not dependent on the world for handouts. Why should I be w worried about you know, whether my little petty desires are being fulfilled or not? Not afraid of the stick, the carrot and the stick. Jahati, a very important point, gives up this attitude and takes to karma yoga but this gives up very beautiful point is made here remember always you can do this only by the grace of god very beautiful point he says ihaiva janmani in this life the verse makes a good point ihaiva that means iha iha means here in this life not in our, you, when do you become enlightened after death no 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 here now but it takes a great great grace to be able to really do this. One must have a prayerful heart. What he says, the commentator says, Ihaiva janmani parameshwara prasade na jahati tyajati. Only by the grace, great grace of Lord, one is blessed with such a mind, which wants to be spiritual, which gives up little desires in the world with ease. Otherwise, what will happen, you know? I have seen this happen. I remember one young man, he was a monk in the Himalayas in one of our little ashrams on the bank of the Ganga. Unhappy, all the time grumpy, unhappy. And a senior monk scolded him once. Um, I will not quote the exact words which are not very polite. But he said, look, you have been set free from all worldly cares. You have your daily food. It's given to you by society. You have a roof over your head. Nobody wants anything from you, to, you know, that you're not being pulled into anything. You're, you're taken, taken care of. You have, you have the Lord, you have the mantra, you have enough time to meditate with a free heart, uh, a clean conscience. Unhappiness is the sign of desire. What do you want, he says. And then he gave a list of what he might be wanting, that's why I'm, what I'm avoiding. <laughs> Yeah. See, the way he put it was, these are the things that we provide 
and amongst life you get it. And these are the things we do not provide. But you have clearly said, I don't want these things. That's the meaning of becoming a monk. But you see, it's easy to say that. If you really deep inside, if somebody wants it, the result will be unhappiness. Swami Ranganathan, and I still remember, he was the president of the order. He said, simple instruction for spiritual seeker. Young novices, he would say, never grumble. Never grumble. Once you've become a spiritual seeker, you've given up the right to complain. <laughs> never grumble. I don't know if I should say this, but I'll say it anyway. I, I heard it from a senior monk who saw it long time ago. Swami Vireshwaranandaji was the president of our order at that time. And in the main monastery, the monks go for offering pranams to the president of the order. Old monks and the younger ones and the new novices. So one day, an old Swami, he went and out of the innocence of his heart in front of everybody, he said, uh, Maharaj or Swami to the president of the order Swami please bless me I have no um, peace you know in my heart and suddenly the president who is to sit, sit quietly I've seen his pictures even he looks extraordinary he was like a bird of a man he was only 26 kilos how many how much is that in pounds when he passed away he was less than 50 pounds a tiny man but like a literally glowing even in the old black and white pictures he was sitting there this usually serene president of the order, he lashed out sharply to this senior, venerable old monk, get out! To the horror of everybody standing there, and this monk, he went red in the face, he bowed and quick, quickly left the uh, place. After everybody had left, he came back trembling and he fell at the feet of the president and he said, if I've said anything wrong, please forgive me, but I don't know what I said wrong. Then the President, Head Swami, the President, he said in a very quiet and gentle voice, you are a monk of this order. So many people, Calcutta is across the river, so many people from Calcutta, worldly people with all their troubles, they come to you for peace. If you don't have peace, what can I say to you? Which means you have been given all the opportunities for cultivating a spiritual life and getting the peace you want. If at this point you, you say that you don't have peace, what can I say to you? Doesn't matter. Doesn't mean that the Swami had no peace. It, I, what I understand is like a passing cloud. Yeah. It gets a shock and he realizes, yes, of course. What am I worried about? <laughs> yoga karmasu kaushalam. Karmasu yes. So, yoga is skill in action. This has to be well understood. Because I have heard this quoted and misquoted a number of times. So two definitions of yoga we have come across. In 48 verse, Samatvam yoga uchyate. Evenness of mind is called yoga. What is meant by that yoga? Karma yoga. What evenness of mind? When you are doing work, why is the mind, uh, why is there evenness? Because my internal compass is towards God. External results do not matter. That's why the evenness of mind is there. Then I'm doing karma yoga. Another definition of yoga is given here. It's also karma yoga. It says skill in action is yoga. Misquoted immediately. People think if you are an expert in something, you do the work very well. That's good. And that's a sign of a concentrated mind, a trained mind. Good. But that's not what is meant by yoga. What is meant here is skill in action is yoga. It means that skill which transforms the daily activities of the world which are usually binding, which catch you in samsara, using those to get free of samsara, that is the skill. Actions which bind us in the world to that skill which uses those very actions to set us free from the world, from samsara, that is skill action, that is yoga. What yoga is that? Karma yoga. That is karma yoga. But a very beautiful description. Learn that skill of action in work in job, in family, in your interactions with people. In what is that spiritual skill which will transform this action into a spiritual encounter for me internally and not trap me further in life, in, in samsara. In con why is this important? In contrast to it is the path of the traditional monk 
who simply gives up these actions altogether. I don't have a job, I don't have a family, so as a traditional uh, in a monastic life, no job, no money, no family, no property, relationships, I had the same relationship with everybody, especially the relationship might be there with the guru, uh, but that's also a spiritual relationship. Otherwise, I have the same relationship with everybody. And so that solves the problem of relationships. So that is a traditional monastic life. But suppose you don't do that. You come to continue with life in the world. Then how do you do it? What do you do for 16 hours a day when you're dealing with the, with the office and the, and the family and skill in action? So the Sanskrit commentary here is, Kaushalam, skill. Bandhakanam api tesham ishvara radhanena moksha paratva sampadana, sampadana, sampadana chaturyam. <laughs> chaturyam means that skill, that uh, cleverness is not a good word, that intelligence, that which, bandhakanam api, those actions which normally bind us in the world, they are used. He says, moksha paratva sampadana. How do I convert them that they are helpful for my moksha, liberation, salvation? Um, how? You will notice Ishwara Aradhani you know, is introduced by worship of God. Nowhere in the picture, God. But uh, that means Karma Yoga done as worship of God. It, he continues. 51. Karma jam buddhi yuktahi, Karma jam buddhi yuktahi, Palam tyaktva manishina, Palam tyaktva manishina, Janma bandha vinir mukta, Janma bandha vinir mukta, Padam gachantya namayam. Padam gachantyanamayam Endowed with this wisdom, giving up the results of action, attaining self-realization, freed from the bondage of birth and death, they go to that abode which is free from evil. So the whole process is mentioned here. Keep in mind the framework. What happens? Karmajam buddhi yuktahi phalam tyaktva Giving up the results of action. How? Buddhi Yukta, being, uh, practicing Karma Yoga. Buddhi here means Karma Yoga. Practicing that Karma Yoga, one gives up attachment to the results of action. Then what happens? One becomes enlightened through knowledge. Manishina, one becomes enlightened. If you look at the original text, by practicing Karma Yoga, one gives up attachment to the worldly results and becomes Manishi. Manishi here means enlightened. If you look at the commentary, they introduce the structure. So, commentary says, Karmajam phalam tyaktva, giving up the results of, of work. How? Kevalam ishvara aradhana artham karma kurvana, doing work only as worship of God. Then, is equal to manishino jnani no bhutva, becoming a jnani. Even the word jnana is not, the word knowledge is not even mentioned here. They introduce. What are they doing? They are building up that structure, that, that uh, mat matrix. <laughs> so that's there. Then what is the result of becoming enlightened jnani? Janma, janma rupena bandhena vinir muktaha, being free of the bondage of life and death. Birth and death. Being free of the bondage of birth and death. So this is how traditionally Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs understood the spiritual problem. It's a formulation, particular formulation, that we are, we are undergoing a cycle of birth and death, and freedom is freedom from this cycle of birth and death. Somebody asked me, but suppose uh, those who follow Abrahamic religions, we don't talk, don't talk about multiple lives of births and deaths, just this one life. So there, you need not put the whole thing in the form of birth and death. You can put it in the form of suffering. Transcending suffering, attainment of permanent peace and bliss, that is also moksha, that's the same thing. That, in the world view of the Hindu, is freedom from the cycle of birth and death. Do you understand the two models? The birth and death model may not be acceptable to those who do not believe in multiple lives. 
but transcending suffering and attainment of peace and bliss everybody wants just every living being wants it and then so being free then where do they go it says so the language here is very beautiful padam gachanti anamaya anamayam they go to that uh, that state or that abode which is forever free of trouble in sanskrit anamayam sarva upadrava ravi rahitam vishnoho padam mokshakyam gachanti they attain that that state which is beyond suffering sarva upadrava rahitam forever beyond suffering what is that state look how it is introduced vishnu hopadam the the state of vishnu literally the word vishnu if you sanskrit if you look at it normally if you say vishnu it's immediately a hindu deity and you know there's a particular iconography art mythology but if you look at the vishnu that which is all pervading is vishnu which is what is all pervading atman or brahman our real nature you attain to that mokshakyam that itself is called freedom or moksha so this is the meaning practice karma yoga and i'm adding here through meditation and all that finally you come to gyana yoga through gyana you get <laughs> enlightenment uh, this is called manishina and through that enlightenment one overcomes the cycle of birth and death where does one go to that abode or state which is already yours which you are actually which is um oneness with brahman or your your real nature moksha freedom nirvana salvation whatever you call it just a couple of more verses are there before arjuna's question will come that we will see um next time i was um, oh you have a question um so you see one of the beauty of a uh, gita is its universality yes been mentioning all the time that uh, no god is not being mentioned in, in the discussion so far it's going to come pretty quickly <laughs> but uh, i just want to there are two stories in the mahabharat where there was a housewife who became enlightened yes and another one was a butcher a butcher who became enlightened like the trade um, in in the same manner of karma yoga and the monk was not enlightened right. the monk was not yeah the monk was taught by the housewife and was taught by the butcher and they all they did it by practicing karma yoga yeah i'll come to you just be one book i was reading recently is by a french philosopher it's called a brief history of thought i picked it up from the bookshop because of the french they don't like the english or the americans so they are very independent in their thought and so I was surprised. I've read so many books about Western philosophy, but they are all English books. This book is a translation from the French. His name is Luc Ferry. He was he is a philosopher. He was the French education minister also. Uh the whole book is a is talking about Western thought from starting from the Greeks. But the presentation is entirely different. Quite different from what you come across in um Uh, books written by english authors or american uh, philosophers if you just go to the recommended reading at the back not a single work by any english or american author is cited it's all by two three french authors and one german author and finished <laughs> but what is interesting is the way he puts it very uh, remarkable you may agree or disagree with this but it gives you a very sweeping world view of of the western thought he says basically three things are there in philosophy in in uh, philosophical thought three things one is he says theory uh, he uses the original theoria which he says it means i see which is the exact sanskrit equivalent of darshana to see to see the ultimate reality <laughs> theory what is your theory about the ultimate reality second is ethics what are we to do and third is salvation he says how what is the answer in that particular system in any system to the great problem of death i have never seen it put this way by any 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 western philosopher this is literally the way indians understand philosophy what is the solution to the problem of death what are we to do and what is the nature of ultimate reality you can easily answer those questions from a vedantic perspective you can answer it from a buddhist perspective 
And what this uh, philosopher does is, he says, in the West we have had four great waves of thought. One is the Greek thought, that was overthrown by Christianity. And then Christianity was overthrown by what he calls modernism, you know, rationality, science. And then he says modernism is under challenge by what is called postmodernity. And very interestingly, at the end he says, if you ask me to choose, and each one, what do they say about ultimate reality, theoria? What do they say about ethics? What are we to do? And what do they say about salvation? He says, as far as salvation is concerned, ultimate uh, freedom from suffering, from death. And he says, I would always prefer the Christian, uh, uh, I would prefer Christianity in comparison to Greek thinking and modernism and postmodernism. Remember, it's a 21st century French philosopher. But being French, he is always there's a twist in the tail. So he says, I always would prefer Christianity, except that I don't believe it's true. <laughs> <laughs> except that it's false. So I can't believe in it. Now what am I left with? Um, this, is what is, this is the beauty of Vedanta. Swami Vivekananda re redefined, represented Vedanta in this age as the science of religion, as the underlying logic of religion. I've heard many people, a well-known Muslim uh, preacher in India, who said I was a very atheistic young student and I became interested in religion only after reading Vedanta and Vivekananda. And I became interested in Islam. And I got back my faith in my religion. I've heard people who became interested in their religion, in their faith also, because of uh, this insight from Vedanta. You should send it to Luke Ferry, this, <laughs> this book, if he can recover his faith in... Yes, so the que let's hear the questions before we end. Yes. So, uh, I mean, we have a luxury of karma yoga and uh, meditation and everything, but how about the animals? How do they enlightenment? And, I mean, they enlightenment for animals? They'll have to wait <laughs> until... <laughs> Until they come into, no, the, they'll have to wait. The, the, the result is that the, sen, what do you mean by animals? It, you mean the sentient being the jiva in an animal body. Yeah. So when the karma being burnt up, the bad karma being burnt up, uh, being in an animal body, when it's, it's gone, the body dies, the jiva goes on to other births and hopefully someday the human birth. So in all Indian mythology, Buddhist, Hindu, the human birth is considered very, very rare and very valuable. But why is it valuable? It's valuable because we make spiritual progress in this world. <laughs> you had a question? So, um, I have actually two questions that actually around the Karma Yoga. So, when you were mentioning the meditators of each uh, system of I hope I didn't scare you of the yogas. So I've decided not to practice any of the yogas. The side effects sound too bad. <laughs> uh, no, yes, go on. And extroverted. Yes. It's, it's duty, you can take it as duty, as uh, helpful to other people, as my worship of God. One or more or all of these. Yeah, but for most people, the work they do, not that it is evil, but it seems far-fetched to connect it to how it is, you know, uh, particularly beneficial for the world. Or but is it duty? Is it I'm doing it to maintain myself and my family? So uh, then it becomes your duty, right? If you're taking salary from it. If you're getting paid for that job, then it's your duty to deliver, right? Arjuna's work, the nastiest work possible. Uh, warrior in a battlefield. And so duty, you can take it as duty. You can take it as, here itself I worship my Lord. This, this work I'm doing, this coding I'm doing, or this files I'm signing, or this deal I'm closing, I'm mentally I offer it to the Lord. You can do that. Any work can be connected, which is not openly immoral. Any work can be connected and offered to God. <coughs> Very good. Uh, let's conclude here. 
ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम तत्सत श्री राम कृष्णारूपणमस्तु do you notice the thing which we say at the end shri ramakrishna arpanam astu we offer this work along with its results to at the feet of shri ramakrishna this is karma yoga this we should do for all work your first question i didn't answer getting swept away so the, getting swept away is not the consequence of karma yoga it's a danger you and you will not get swept away if you do karma yoga properly without attachment to results who gets swept away who gets attached to the results <laughs> 